I see loneliness everywhere. Loneliness is something I've incredibly suffered, actually. Um, I used to suffer loneliness so uh, severely to the point of creating addictions around certain things that would um, help diminish the pain of loneliness that would be caused. I mean, you know, many addictions. Success off another breath. This the first step in searching to be nothing less than be the best in what you do to prove their strength in being you. Learn so much in chasing dreams that I never would in school. And what's going on, guys? Kieran Eadley here from the Pocket Coach Podcast, the place where we speak about mental health and performance through the bridge between science and mindfulness. We bring on doctors and specialists in their fields to talk about their expertise on these aspects of life. And sometimes you'll get your boy Kezza jumping in and doing a little riff on something. And today, your boy Kezza is jumping on doing a little riff on loneliness. One of the most seemingly common human experiences that there are. I see loneliness everywhere. Loneliness is something I've incredibly suffered, actually. Um, I used to suffer loneliness so uh, severely to the point of creating addictions around certain things that would um, help diminish the pain of loneliness that would be caused. I mean, you know, many addictions from the place of pornography to uh, alcohol because that enhanced my social ability to create social connections to help quell the deep loneliness I had um, when I was finally confident enough. Um, and this took a very long time. Um, I'd be able to sleep with um, women and by doing so that quelled my loneliness um, by trying to uh, without even realizing I was doing it trying to control my relationship at like you know in many moments in my life uh, to ensure that I could quell my loneliness um, because you know my needs needed to be met in order to, for everything to be okay in the relationship um over the other person's needs um that's sort of the way mine would go because i so desperately wanted to quell my loneliness so there's been an immense amount of suffering that's been created in my own life through loneliness and i see it all over the place um uh, it is something that i am fairly free of today there are definitely moments don't get me wrong where right, loneliness will still come into my life so uh, it's definitely there. However, uh, it's something that I'm very aware of when it starts to creep in and I know exactly what I need to do to shift it. So that's what we're going to speak about today. But before we talk about how, well, how, do, how do I stop feeling lonely, <laughs> let's speak a little bit about what it is and what people are doing currently around loneliness. So first of all, loneliness is this deep sense of longing. That one gets right a deep sense of longing right this longingness of cultivating some some, some form of fulfillment or completeness that they don't feel quite already right so basically if you can imagine a half-filled cup finding a way to fill that cup now most people don't know how to do that themselves so therefore what do they do they find an animal <laughs> a lovely dog a lovely cat a rabbit and some people love spiders, uh, crazy people. And then, you know, most people use other humans to do this uh, through constantly needing to be around other people, through needing their relationship to be a specific way. And the moment it is in a specific way, they're very triggered. They feel unseen, unheard because they're not seen or heard by themselves. Therefore, suffering arises. Loneliness. Right? So the feeling of not being seen or heard, the feeling of not feeling complete as one is, loneliness. Now, we sort of understand what it is, we sort of understand well, what people are doing. A lot of people that can't um, get that human interaction or even animal interaction might resort to some sort of thing that will uh, trigger an immense amount of serotonin or dopamine in their system um, maybe even oxytocin depending on the drug or stimulant they might go for um, that's why pornography is such an addictive thing especially for guys i know it's a big thing for girls as well in some cir circumstances um, but ultimately uh, the pleasurable aspect does release oxytocin which you know is quote unquote the love slash trust chemical if you were to put put a category um, in terms of what that, that, uh, that hormone is but uh, ultimately, 
uh, this craving for that experience of lovingness uh, becomes very intense when we start to lack it, when we start to not have much of this lovingness in our life. Um, some people even get it through um, doing long hours at work. Not because they get a deep sense of lovingness for it, but for the potential that it might bring a sense of status, therefore leading to that deep, deep experience of lovingness from others, right? So there's still a bridge there. It's indirect, but it's still there. So loneliness really does rule a lot of people in many ways. Oftentimes, we might even do uh, um, and make many choices in our lives, like go to university, like get a specific job, like take the... Uh, uh, like take a specific role that one might not be comfortable or happy with, but they're doing it out of this deep sense of feeling like they should. Why? Because by doing so, we improve our status. By improving our status in some shape or form, we can get a deeper sense of acknowledgement from, other, from others around us. Therefore, we feel less lonely, right? So is that acknowledgement maybe from our parents? They feel proud, prideful for us, right? Is that from our friends, right? They find they finally respect us, and this is definitely a struggle I had. It's not that my friends disrespected me; it's the fact that I thought that I needed their more of their respect because I didn't respect myself. So I, I craved that deeply from others, and I would, you know, pursue, 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 chase, 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 um, all this different, like all the all, all this monetary success in my life, and. <laughs> I uh, just ended up in anxiety and depression and um, even more loneliness, to be honest. Man, yeah, there's it's been a lot of loneliness in my life. And, um, you know, that was out of the deep craving of respect from others because I felt lonely. Um, you know, some people just do it for even people they do not like. <laughs> I don't like this person, therefore I need to prove to them that I'm respectful, right? So, I mean, it's crazy, you know, a lot of the things that people do for even the people they do not like. Yeah, so we get the essence of what loneliness is, right? Okay, well, well, what is it at its essence? That's what a lot of people don't quite grasp. At its essence, right, as I mentioned earlier, yes, loneliness is a form of incompleteness. So some people might come to the concept that, okay, well, if incompleteness is loneliness, therefore, what if I pursued contentment? Or what if I fixed everything around me? Those are usually sort of the two uh, paths people take with loneliness, right? So they go to, a, like, they basically find a way to find contentment. So they might go very spiritual, right? Um, I've seen that many times. And they, you know, get a van and live in a van for a year. Or they, um, you know, they run away to Bali like I did. Okay, I've done this. So I'm not, you know... Um, you know, pointing at anyone, pointing fingers or anything. I'm literally these are things that I've considered or I've done, and uh, um, or um, so those are sort of ways to find a sense of contentment, right? So chasing contentment, chasing this feeling of completeness in a way, through uh, uh, secluding oneself or through um, going to a certain extreme contentment. And then the other people, of course, as we've already mentioned, which is most people, try to fix everything around them in order. To find some completeness. Unfortunately, most things in this life do not go the way that we want them to. A small fraction do, but most things don't. Why? Because they need to go a little bit my way, a little bit your way, a little bit someone else's way. They can't go all your way or all my way, because if they went all your way, <laughs> what happens to me? <laughs> what happens to kids, right? And then if they go all my way, well, what happens to you, dear listener? What happens to you? I might not even know you, <laughs> right? And then if I fix things in a certain way, right, it might not be in your favor. So the nature of the universe, of the world, is that we all get a say somewhat to some degree as to how things go, somewhat, right? Even if you feel like the least significant human in this world, right, um, there's still some potential for you to control certain aspects of your environment. There still are, right? Because, well, we have this amazing thing called a consciousness, right? A we have cerebral capabilities, right? Cerebral capabilities meaning the more outer layer of the brain, which enables more planning and action on and execution on planning, right? So in other words, conscious capabilities. So because of this, right? Yes, we have some control, but we don't have 
much entirely. We have influence and ability to influence, but ultimately I cannot control what you do, what you think, and what you feel, right? I can influence it, but I can't control it. Now, with that understanding, if I try to fix everything around me to the way that I want things to be, I'm going to be in constant pursuit for the rest of my life until I die. <laughs> and I love what Sadhguru says. He says, only such people will rest in peace. They will never truly be peaceful. <laughs> and that's very true. I spent most of my life like this. So we know that both, well, first of all, trying to uh, complete things around isn't going to create internal completion because that's not feasible, practical, possible. There's only short moments, right? When, um, you know, you get that promo, you, um, job promo, you get the, you get a certain amount of money, you get a gift, you, uh, loved one says, hey, I love you, right? These little moments of things go exactly the way that you want them to, great, but they're not always happening like that, right? It's only very momentary. So yeah, there's only uh, momentary gratification in those moments. Now, I mentioned contentment. Yeah, well, contentment sounds like, you know, that could be quite good, quite peaceful, quite nice. I might not feel lonely. Yeah, but contentment is also containment. What you felt would be content, would help you to be content at 10 years old, I guarantee no longer lasts when you're 15. And what you feel at 15, I guarantee no longer lasts when you're 20. When you're 20, what you think, man, this would make me content. I guarantee by 30, <laughs> it, probably by even 21, <laughs> it's not going to be the same. Why? Because the parameters of what you perceive as contentment are constantly expanding and changing and transforming. So therefore, to be able to cultivate contentment is also out of the question because that's always changing and transforming and all these, all these different concepts, right? Well, we talk about contentment with where I am and how I am. Great. But a lot of people, first of all, are scared of contentment because they might think, oh, <laughs> I won't do what I need to do if I'm content. Uh, so that's pretty big baloney. Um, <laughs> um, honestly, people that are really in a state of, um, yeah, when, when you're in a certain state of contentment, uh, yes, there's um, maybe things that you might not be willing to do. But if one is really in a place of peace, on the other hand, they'll be willing to do whatever it takes. And I'll speak on that in a second. So contentment itself is not a concept that we really want to pursue too much in the sense of uh, overall quelling of suffering, right? Contentment is a great uh, attribute to use. It's a great tool to use. Right? Practicing a state of contentment and gratitude is fantastic. However, it's not going to quell the loneliness. There's a difference between contentment and peace. Peace, which is actually, um, for those watching on video, is the banner on the wall behind me. It represents peace. It also represents harmony. It's a kanji symbol, Japanese kanji symbol, for peace and harmony. The beauty about this is that it quite literally means the same thing. You can't have peace without harmony. And harmony is a cultivation of peace. What it's referring to and the reason why it's the same symbol is because by creating harmony within oneself, only then can one be peaceful. That's what it means. By creating harmony in the world, only then can the world be peaceful. That's what it means. So whatever environment that harmony exists, that's where peace will also exist. And once peace exists, that's where loneliness will completely dissipate because what need is there for completion when things are already operating beautifully as they are there's nothing more to complete so what this is referring to is that rather than trying to create contentment within because that's always changing transforming right you become content for one moment and then the next moment you want something else <laughs> so contentment is, is an endless pursuit however if you seek harmonization or harmony within oneself, within yourself, you can then come to a place of peace and therefore loneliness dissipates. So how do we come to a place of harmony within, right? Well, essentially harmony is alignment or flow, if you will. So it's flow without resistance. 
Now, what's flow without resistance? Well, if you were to say experience sadness, you're probably going to resist the sadness. Well, that's not harmony, right? If you feel happy, right, you're probably going to resist any other emotion other than happiness. So as soon as happiness starts to subside, you're like, oh, I, don't, I want to stay happy. <laughs> so that's not in harmony either. So harmony is coming to a place when emotions flow, you also flow with them. Not in a way where they take over you, but where you're in a place where you can actually consciously be with those emotions. So what this means is that when sadness arises, it's not, oh, I need to stop feeling sad. And, it, like, and then you, you know, either react to it and get really busy or take some drugs or you know, whatever is your MO, or you hide away. You, it overwhelms you, right? It overtakes, like it completely overwhelms you, overcomes you. And I've been in both states. Now, this isn't in harmony at all. This is in resistance. Now, when we're in resistance to something, that's what we suffer, not the thing itself. This is very difficult to actually explain to people that haven't had this experience, but I can just share with my experience. I spent, um, there was a time when I'd spent months on end where I didn't want to leave my bed. Be a, there was a time when I spent months on end where I couldn't even feel a shred of happiness in my life. And then there'd be, you know, little moments where, oh, actually, you know what? Things are okay. Just little moments, like a song might come on and be like, oh, actually things are okay. Or so, uh, someone might message me something. And it's like, oh, that's nice. Actually, things are okay. So even though the emotion is still present, I'm more accepting of that situation. I might eat something, right? That tastes good. It's like, oh, yeah, that's nice. Or I might watch something and it might laugh, make me laugh a little, right? Oh, things are actually okay, right? In that moment, things seem okay just for that few, those few seconds. And when they do, I'm more in harmony with the way things are. Now, where I've come to is that when sadness does arise, yes, it still arises with me, right? When sadness does arise, I'm more accepting of it. It usually takes me hours, if not, you know, a day or two, and I'm fully through it. Whatever triggered the sadness, I get to fully move through to a place of harmony and therefore peace and therefore no longer in a space of craving or longingness, in other words, loneliness. So here are some ways that you can start to implement to bring about a greater sense of harmony within yourself, therefore a greater sense of peace and less loneliness. The first is change your environment and ensure that you are involved in nature. Now, we hear about, oh, nature heals. Yes, it really does. <laughs> it really does, guys. Um, quite honestly, we actually, when we're experiencing loneliness, we also release this um, neuropeptide called tachykinin. Okay, so tachykinin gets released when we don't have very much um, contact with human beings. And um, also as well, if we're not experiencing a sense of completeness, right? If we're in a deep sense of loneliness and isolation, Right, we start to release tachykinin. Now, tachykinin has all sorts of other um, effects that can come into play in, in, in the system, but ultimately, um, when you get that deep sense of um, suffering from that loneliness, that's the tachykinin experience. So ultimately, uh, one way to actually help quell this, believe it or not, is actually to immerse yourself in nature and to feel a connection with nature. So what this means is you might go to a waterfall, see a beautiful waterfall, and be like, oh, it's a lovely waterfall. Or um, go into a forest and see some beautiful trees. Ah, oh, it's a beautiful forest, beautiful trees. <laughs> All the beautiful bird sounds, right? If you learn to be present in that situation in nature, you're actually going to be uh, enabling a decrease in this tachykinin release and a quelling of the loneliness. Why? Because you're in more harmony in that moment, right? So putting yourself in nature even once a week it's a fantastic practice to implement in order to help with uh, the sense of loneliness. In fact, I actually live um, around lots of trees, so that's a big thing for me. And um, I'm actually heading down to Taupo um, for those in New Zealand that, um, that aren't in New Zealand. It's like this nice cold place with a big lake and a couple of volcanoes hanging around. <laughs> that's where I'm going to go for about three nights from today onward. Um, just to really sit with myself and really create some more harmony within myself because I find that, and I know that this is true for all beings, but pe most people just don't recognize it, is that when they're in harmony with themselves, things move more fluidly. 
Why? Because things operate within more fluidly, right? So you're acting less out of compulsion. In other words, less out of conditioning. And you're acting more in a way where you can choose how you want to be and choose what you want to do. Why? Because you're no longer in that compulsive state. You're in a conscious state. To be in a conscious state, we want to be in a place where we're first with ha in harmony within, right? Otherwise, you're constantly acting out of the conditioning, the craving, the need for all sorts of different things. So therefore, you're in pursuit of things. If you're in pursuit of things, you can only see things one directionally or singularly directionally. Um, that was that, Hopefully, that phrase makes sense. <laughs> Right, we can see things more as they are and from a broader perspective when we're in a state of peace. Therefore, we more clarity comes into play. Therefore, I can make decisions more easily. And by making decisions more easily, I can also create a result, more, an more ideal result more easily as well. So get into nature more often. That is a biggie. The second, meditation. You probably saw this one coming. <laughs> Meditation. Well, what, what do you mean? Right? I, I can't sit still, Karen. <laughs> I can't sit still, Karen. <laughs> I, I don't like meditation, right? Is what you know, a lot of people come to. Um, they can't meditate, right? Meditation is not for me. Yeah, yeah. It's only not for you because you say it's not for you. It's actually for everyone. Meditation isn't the practice of sitting still and closing your eyes. It's a practice of coming to a place of harmony within. That's what meditation is. And if meditation isn't for you, you're basically saying that peace is not within the uh, parameters of my entire life. <laughs> uh, yeah, and such people do believe that, which is also bullcrap. Peace is available for everyone. We all have a human brain. If we all have a human brain, if you're listening to this and can understand the words that I'm saying, you probably have a human brain. Peace is possible. Peace is entirely possible. So how do we come to a place where we're able to create a sense of actually ability to sit still and uh, be with oneself during meditation? Well, it's just simple. You practice it just like anything, right? You don't learn a language because you say, I can, all of us, I'm going to learn French and then tomorrow you speak French. No, it's going to be je ne sais pas. <laughs> You're not going to have it. It's the same with meditation. It's not like you can wake up the next day and be able to meditate for an hour when you've never meditated before, right? You can, it's going to be, well, you might be able to, but it's going to be friggin' tough. You're not going to have any, any sort of concentration or relaxation. It's going to be very tense. So practice. Start with a minute a day, then five minutes a day, then 10 minutes a day, then 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, and so on, right? And ideally, first thing in the morning, right? Um, because that's before your day starts, right? Or you can do it in the evening, that's fine. But ideally, when you're starting to be become awake is a great time to start with the meditation practice. Now, when you're coming into a meditation practice, it's more so that you're allowing things to flow rather than resisting things from flowing. When people meditate, they're like, I need to stop thinking. No, you're resisting. No, let your mind think, right? People are trying to control their breath. No, let the breath flow, right? People are trying to uh, suppress and stop emotions from flowing because they need to feel calm. They need to feel peaceful. No, let those emotions flow. So meditation is your opportunity, your a perfect opportunity to actually allow things to flow as they are. And in this state, you're practicing acceptance. Practicing acceptance. So essentially, when a, when a sadness might flow within you or some overwhelming thoughts might flow, you're practicing your ability to come to acceptance for what they are. In doing so, you actually decrease the level of reactiveness your brain has to these human experiences. By doing that, you decrease the level of stress in your system and you come to a greater place of, yes, harmony. So if you want to come to a place where you don't feel as lonely, you practice being still. You practice being still fully with everything within yourself as it is without resistance. There's a couple of methods that you can do. One is simply by whenever everything flows and comes up, you just have an internal mantra, whatever that might be. And this is just a tool. It's not a solution, but the tool might be um, even with these thoughts, even with these emotions, I am okay. Or even with this thing happening in my life at the moment, I am safe. Or even with the sadness that I'm feeling at the moment, I am okay. Right, these sort of um, mantras that one might have when they're fe feeling into and thinking and feeling into thoughts and emotions that flow. 
another way uh, might be to breathe into them. So when you start to notice a very strong emotion, breathing deeply into that emotion or deeply into that thought process really allows things to flow. So practice meditation, practice stillness, and practice harmony within through the fact of acceptance. Learning to accept the way things are within you just as they are. And eventually you'll come to a place where you no longer feel lonely. Yes, this is true. And the third thing I'm going to offer is just this. Most people are so unpresent at all times. Even when you're listening to this, I can guarantee you're thinking about and processing about, you know, processing the things that I'm saying, or you're zoning out and <laughs> and not listening to me, all right? Then, yeah, you're not very present, right? Presence as being in a state of mindlessness, not mindfulness, mindlessness. Mindlessness meaning you're here right now. Here. <laughs> and not thinking about the present, rather you're with the present, right? So what this means is if I was to ask you to take a deep breath right now, interfering with your natural process of breathing and then observe your surroundings notice maybe three different things around you three different sounds around you see if you can notice any different smells in the air what do you feel with your fingers and the soles of your feet Do you have a taste in your mouth? A lot of people might be saying coffee right now. <laughs> so ultimately, when you really tune into these senses, right, that's one way to tap more into presence. When you do, what happens? Loneliness doesn't exist in those moments. It cannot exist. Only if you're fully present. If you're not fully present, it will still exist. But when you choose, choose to be fully present and you practice presence more often throughout the day through your sensory organs, by taking a breath, by really tuning into your environment around you, you're also as well intervening with old conditioning and enabling a new process to come into play of transformation, of consciousness. And by doing so, you create greater harmony within yourself as well. Therefore, more peace, therefore, less loneliness. So these are three things you can start to do more often to help with a greater sense of harmony within. I love the quote by Sadhguru. He says, if you're alone and you feel lonely, it means you're in bad company. <laughs> yeah. This honestly triggered me the first time I heard I'm like, oh, right. I don't actually like my own company. I constantly need to fix everything. I need things to go my way. I need all these different things to happen in order to feel, to feel complete. Therefore, me as I am, I'm not enjoying myself as I am right this moment. So, harmony within will enable you to actually enjoy yourself as you are. Will actually be, I'm mean, enable you to enjoy your company. Right? And the fourth and final thing is actually just going off that as well. I mean, it's pretty straightforward doing more things that you enjoy. Heck. Sounds obvious? Most people don't do it. Doing more things that you enjoy will enable for a greater sense of enjoyment for yourself. Blocking out a little bit of time each week, quite literally factoring in one hour during a week or you know, maybe a three hour period on the weekend or maybe an entire day on the weekend where it's like, this day is for me and no one else, right? Great, you're prioritizing yourself. This will make a world of difference. If you were to start with any of those four that I just shared, start with the last two. Being more present more often and blocking out some time just for you to do something that you want. That's ideally not Netflix, <laughs> but something to do with uh, where you get to be involved with something. Right? And that might be, you know, you go to the beach. It might be you read a book. It might be, you know, you do go for a walk in nature. It might be that you educate yourself on something that you're really interested in that you don't usually make time for, right? Whatever that is for you. So I look forward to hearing how you guys lean into loneliness and start to cultivate greater, greater harmony within and therefore 
a greater sense of peace within yourself. Because only then, only then, will loneliness truly dissipate. Because now you get to feel a sense of completeness within yourself. And therefore, when you act around others, it's no longer out of desperation or need or longingness. It's out of a place of compassion. Because true compassion comes from a sense of harmony and completeness within. If you want to practice love for another, I know you hear the old saying, you need to love yourself first. Well, that's very true, but loving yourself first isn't the accumulation of things. Loving yourself first is coming to a place where you're fully at harmony within yourself. Only then can you be a full, compassionate being. And also, you get to uh, live life a little more fully as well, which is quite beautiful. I'm wishing you the best. I love you very much. Follow us on The Pocket Coach on Instagram or Coach Keza on Instagram. Links below in the show notes. Uh, if you have any questions, send them over. If you have a topic you'd like me to speak on, let me know. That would be fantastic. And uh, honestly, uh, the I don't charge for this. Right? Um, this is I don't run ads or anything like that. So uh, if you do felt you gained anything from this, you learned anything or you took anything away, then please do us a favor and share it. Subscribe, share. Um, these things really help us reach other people that genuinely need this information, genuinely need these tools. So I'm wishing you the best. Um, yeah, please do go ahead and give us a little five star. It takes 10 seconds and it helps us tremendously. Um, and yeah, if you um, feel that you'd like to share anything, please go for it. Lots of love. Why do this for you? Take care.